On behalf of all the speakers, I welcome you to the webinar on current practices in burn wound management. This webinar is being done under the aegis of National Burns, Burns India. And uh, in this webinar, I am very thankful to our invited speakers from all over the country who have consented to participate in this webinar. Uh, I'd like to uh, name our speakers. I'd like to honor them. I'd like to, our first speaker would be Dr. S. Raja Sarapati. He would be speaking on principles of hydrosurgery in burns. Before that, I would be starting on principles of burn wound debridement. Dr. Sarapati is chairman, division of plastic surgery, hand surgery, reconstructive microsurgery and burns at Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. Then after Dr. Sarapati, we have Dr. Sanjeev Uppal. He is the president of National Academy of Burns India, consultant plastic surgeon at Fortis Hospital, Ludhiana, and former HOD Dayanand Medical College, Ludhiana. After Dr. Uppal, Dr. Ravi Mahajan is going to speak on principles of nanocrystalline silver dressings in management of burns. He is the president-elect of Association of Plastic Surgeons of India and a very senior consultant plastic surgeon at Amandeep Hospital, Amritsar. Next, we have Dr. Sunil Keswani, who is the medical director of National Burn Center at Navi Mumbai. He will be speaking on principles of management of burns. And after all these short talks, we are going to have a panel discussion, which would, which would be an interactive panel discussion, which would be moderated by Dr. S.M. Keswani. So uh, let's start. First, I would like to speak on the principles of burn wound debridement. Why? Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll be speaking on principles of burn wound debridement. <clears throat> I'm from the Department of Plastic Surgery and Burns at Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow, India. And uh, we do get a lot of patients of burns, both acute burns and chronic burns. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to put a disclaimer that the opinions and results shown are my personal and individual results. And the purpose of this presentation is not to endorse or promote any particular brand. Now, when we talk about debridement in burns, the first thing is that the decision to debride is one of the most important decisions in early and late burn wound management. If the burn wound debridement is late, it often delays wound healing and promotes wound infections precipitously. The incidence of wound infections increases. The key to wound debridement is serial wound debridement, and it is not a single session wound debridement, meaning thereby, whenever you see slough there, you have to go in and debride rather than wait. And it is very important that the correct technique and instrumentation needs to be followed to get desired results. Now, quickly about the classification of burns. We need to know the classification of burns because then only we can see what type of burn we are dealing with, whether it is a superficial burn or a deep burn or it, or, or it is a full thickness burn. And uh, wound debridement is most commonly indicated in full thickness burns. It is also indicated in deep partial thickness burns, which are throwing a lot of slough and infection. So these are the two star indications of burn wound debridement. Now coming on the principles of burn wound debridement, the debridement of the burn wound should be done at the first site of slough and other dead tissue, regardless of the time since burns. Whether it is two days, five days, or 10 days, whenever you see slough, you have to go in and do the debridement. The burn SR is shaved tangentially or is excised down to the deep fascia. That is the rule. What is the end point of debridement? The end point of debridement is complete removal of all the visible slough down. <laughs> and whenever you see punctate bleeding in the wound, that signals that adequate debridement has been done. Till you see punctate bleeding, the wound debridement should be continued layer by layer. Now, how should you perform the debridement? The debridement can be performed using either knife, it could be scissors, it could be a small silver knife, it could be a Watson modification of Humby's knife, 
or it could be air powered dermatome whichever instrument is available at your center for small wounds a silver knife is good but for large wounds a watson modification of humby's knife is good i'm going to show a video showing the use of this instrument now this is a 5 day old deep second degree burns with slough and infection you can see this lady here uh, it is showing a lot of hr it is showing infection it was showing lot of discharge she she sustained burns over the abdomen the breast and the thighs on both the sides and this is the appearance of the thigh this is a 5 day old wound and this wound the lady was running fever so therefore she was planned for wound debridement so now this slide shows how the burn wound debridement is done this is a video you can see the humby's knife is being used to perform the wound debridement and it is convenient because you can control the depth of the wound debridement and by setting the knife you can control the thickness to which extent it will go so this probably gives the most accurate idea about the depth of the tissue and also it gives a regular debridement so there is regular there is no uneven tissue there so once you have made a first pass of the debridement if you see the again the slough is there or in the adjoining areas if there is slough go for that also so by this method you can see how the burn wound can be debrided easily and uh, <clears throat> and you can see good punctured bleeding in the tissue which has been debrided even it is good for any part of the area even the abdominal area can be debrided the humby's knife is good and you can do a good debridement using this knife you can see how a thick chunk of tissue can be removed by this humby's knife so it is easy fast and quick burn wound debridement this is how the tissue looks like just after the burn wound debridement you can see regular good punctured bleeding that means the end point of the debridement has been reached now just one or two reserves here now this was a patient here you can see he came with acute burns and he had a car also which was there which was involved in the burns and he had lot of blisters and deep burns and burn wound debridement and grafting was done for this patient and you can see the result you can obtain after serial wound debridements and serial burn wound grafting meticulous aggressive debridement and aggressive resurfacing of the grafts I would like to conclude by saying that aggressive but time debridement is the key to successful burn wound management. Tangential excision allows controlled wound debridement. The burn wound should be reconstructed by whatever appropriate method you have. It could be autographs or it could be other materials immediately to prevent infection, wound contracture, and early recovery to function. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Dr. S. Raja Sabapati. he would be speaking on principles of hydrosurgery in burns yeah yeah thank you rajiv uh, for the opportunity and uh, since this is going to be a 6 minutes uh, talk i will straight away get on to the uh, subject the topic that has been given to me is the principles of uh, uh, hydrosurgery in burn debridement see the basic tenant is if uh, the outcome is good if the necros part of the burn is excised early and good skin cover is achieved as early as possible then we get uh, good results i think if we really go back into to understand as to what even hydrosurgery does i think uh, we need to go back to the, one of the milestones in burn care was what uh, uh, dr zora zanskovic did in the early 70s in uh, yugoslavia and i would really urge you to read all this original articles uh, Uh, about uh, how she did, and also a, a keynote lecture that she delivered in the United States, so one a medallion lecture. And later on, uh, there is recently published article, "Once Upon a Time: How West Indies Got Its Is Also a Nice Article." So what it was done was what she told was she observed in their burns unit that even if the early excision of full thickness burns to fascia, the alone you know, did not uh, improve uh, outcomes. She observed that the deep dermal burns. gradually got infected and that resulted in the destruction of unburned dermis so what happens is uh, 
This is a full thickness bench. All of us know we need to take it out, take it down, and then graft it. It's not going to heal. But then there is a, a, most of the times we get a, this level of burns, and this could be converted to a full thickness burn by infection or by uh, when, whenever when we excise, you know, if we could uh, we excise it deep, we might not lose the, some amount of dermis that has been formed. And she proposed that the burned part of the skin should be excised and unburned dermis should be covered with graft. I think that's the yeah. uh, milestone. Unburned dermis to cover it. Right? And if you have the some part of the native dermis is maintained in this way, that means you know, the outcome outcomes are better. So this is a patient now has got a dorsal side, uh, dorsal hand burns. And this is the cause now where you find a lot of people who get you know, this sort of spanic deformities, butnia deformities. You need to excise it to this level and then use a thin graft, and then now you can get a you can get a good result. But then there are some issues. One issue is uh, blood loss, and then when you are doing with a blade, I think it can go only at one straight line, and then there are areas of uh, dermis which is good, some areas some areas is not good. That means that are there also go. The inadvertent removal of a little excess of viable dermis is possible. And uh, it stands to reason that uh, more viable dermis you retain, the better is the stability of the burn scar, and then lesser is the contractures, less is the stiffness. So hydrosurgery, how that affects is, uh, it's a short talk. It's the very interesting principles that are behind these uh, machines. Now, if you have a tube and then it goes at a very high pressure, suddenly if that uh, tube becomes smaller. Then the pressure becomes low, but the speed becomes higher. The speed becomes, and then immediately again, when you leave it, then you become the pressure becomes higher, the speed becomes low, but then also some sucking effect also it gets uh, again. You can reach a lot of videos and the YouTube's is there. So the machine that we use is the Vasajet, which you have got. We are one of the early people in the country to uh, get onto this. What it has is a phase where the fluid goes in, and then you got a thing where you get a nozzle, you chuck it. And then it goes on to a very strong, uh, easy, easy put. And then the key part is this. You see this. See, there has got an area. So, so you will find this is a one which has got a 45 degrees angle. That's what we are using. And then you have got uh, two areas that are there. I think this small nozzle. This is the end is a nozzle. I shall go back you now if people who have not seen it. So now you watch this. You will find that the very strong, this is one constricted out and then the piece comes up and then in that uh, fluid goes in. It is that fluid you know, which really cuts off the dead tissue and it's also got a sucking effect. So whenever you water the dead tissue or the der uh, debris, that's there, it gets collected and gets sucked at, the, sucked at the other end. One side the fluid comes in and then it, it, it takes off the dead tissue and then the other side is it. So how it works is in uh, deep partial thickness burns. The necrotic tissue is always found to be softer than the viable tissue. I think that's the next principle. So if you could adjust the flow of fluid and the pressure in such a way that it takes off the softer tissue, then the dermis will be will retain. So in superficial burns, the hydrosurgery cleans and removes loose epidermal elements. You can use it even for a superficial burn and then uh, clean it. So the whole principle is that the hydrosurgery is removed, is useful. When there is a differential thickness of the tissue and uh, the necrotic tissue is softer than a normal viable tissue. And depending upon what we want to achieve, there is a gradation of uh, the force also you do. And higher the pressure that you use, it, it cuts down you know, deeper. See, now you find it. See, here is a patient who burns the sculptor's lid. See how it is done. The, one of the advantages is that it, it, it does it so fast. See, it, it does it so fast and it also gets into this. The amount of you know, bleeding that you have, I think someone of them also commented, how do you reduce blood loss? This one area, now, you see this, we are cutting it and then uh, they're taking it video. And at the end of it, what will happen is you will have a tissue like this. And I think you will get into a, a, sta a stage like this. So we have got a, we can do the whole area. So I think both thighs with this patient that we did it. Okay, I'll show you another, another patient. So the patient has come like this. And then what we have used the Versa jet, and then the end of it, we get into a, get into a stage like this. The advantage is if you are uh, trying to do with a uh, handle, I think now we majority of times we do with the skin drive plate. I think uh, please take a point that we do with the skin drive plate. 
that this is yet another raw material that we have it in our hands they just because you have a hammer and everything must look like a, a nail now okay so but then we have you know very specific issues where the area is large where you think uh, 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 it is possible to do that so this is the end of the result so what we find is the contour is maintained you no know, so because you are not removing a lot of tissue so quite often in these type of uh, burns you might you know go down to the fascia but here when you do this it will always be the video what i what i showed you it will come up like that and then after that we cover them with the uh, skin graft and that's the shape of the result you get so one advantage is that you will find because here and there the dermis is get retained the quality of final scar that you get you know will always be better when you when you do it this way i think that's a marginal advantage that is there in these things so loss of the dermis is one of the principal factors that contributes to poor scar outcome after severe burn okay so dermal loss it could be due to the primary injury or sometimes now when we start exercising it could be due to surgical management or it could be the result of uh, infection so uh, the early tangential excision with dr zora zentovic told or you know, with the hydro surgery desk they are all you not know, trying to uh, are all in the same basket of te techniques where you preserve the dermal preservation so that you now you improve the swelling so how does it help it preserves dermal tissue as the hand piece you know, travels tangentially over the soft surface it creates a smooth wound bed while maximizing dermal preservation and the tissue producing because we do this we find that the number of days you now we take to totally cover the wound you now it becomes you now much less the only limitation is the cost of care i think being a webinar i like don't like to discuss the cost the exact cost of care i think what really is expensive is both the machine and the disposable handle or are, uh, are expensive so that, that's one point there but then if you read the literature and there are a lot of claims and then a lot of studies which have been published studies they all show that the clinical outcomes and uh, health economic outcomes i think both are important uh, one is the cost and the other is the quality and they say it outweighs the cost but uh, what we would really like i think there is no study in the indian condition because the cost of care of many variables like the operating theater time mm -hmm. and the compensation of the medical professionals I think different in different uh, environments. So I think what really is required is to have a study in in India, uh, where whether this uh, technology will be cost cost effective. That's one. But then we, you can be very sure that is a good technology. I think it's a good technology. It's based on uh, uh, sound principles, and it has got a definite role to play in a niche segment of K in a burn K, so that now you can get uh, uh, good, good outcomes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, So for what of time and i could just only uh, tell you about this so if you have any doubts now we should go about in our uh, discussion time thank you rajiv and thank all of you who have come on this sunday morning well thank you dr sarvati for a very nice lecture and very nice illustration of the debridement hydrosurgery debridement and bones it was a real treat to watch your lecture next i would like to invite dr sanjeev uppal from ludhiana and he is going to speak on principles of management of burn wound infection dr sanjeev uppal please डॉक्टर ओपल प्लीज अनम्यूट योर ऑडियो प्लीज yeah that's fine now it's okay yes you are able to hear thank you so much please go sir so a very good morning to all present and uh, thank you rajiv for organizing such a nice meeting so we'll be quite short uh, as the time doesn't permit us to be in so much detail 
So primary concerns regarding the infection and burns are number one, of course, is the prevention. Then is the surveillance for detecting infections quite early. And that then after that, we'll discuss the diagnostic part, how to diagnose infection. And then of course, the treatment part. The treatment part, I'll not uh, touch in detail because the uh, my speakers following me will be discussing in detail. So catching infection is uh, right. Patient can catch infection right on this spot once she has been burnt or she has been burnt and then people try to put in either soil or put in something or wrap the patient in a dirty cloth or apply some ink or some creams of their own. So that can uh, be the reason for catching infection on this spot. And second is the during transport. During transport, it is always recommended that a clean cloth should be wrapped and patient should not be, even if we are putting water on the patient and just after 10 minutes to 15 minutes, we should wrap patient nicely so that there is no hypothermia and also it um, protects the patient from the infection. Then is of course in the ER, many uh, hospitals, they will have the patient first in the emergency room that the patient is um, for medical legal reasons and for other inspection reasons is kept uh, without any covering. And uh, many times it stays uh, for an hour or one and a half, two hours in such a condition. So one can catch the infection from ER. And then, of course, in the burns unit, we need to be very, very careful about uh, the prevention, like the barrier nursing and other things. So what is the epidemiology of infection we have? We have a, a source of organism, which can be either the person himself from within the body or outside the body. Then are the mode of transmission, which can be direct or by uh, the nosocomial, by certain objects like bed sheets, beds, and other equipments in the hospital. And then is the susceptible patients. So there are some patients who are suffering from chronic diseases or immunocompromised already. So these three uh, things will be causing infection in a much aggressive way. So then the sources of infection, if we see the endogenous is the normal flora of the body. Once the patient becomes immunocompromised, that very flora will lead to infection. Hello. Yeah. And then is the exogenous, that is the environment and uh, the hospital kind of things, like the colonized patients, if there is a patient lying in the same unit, which is a, uh, already infected and uh, there's no barrier nursing. Then is the contaminated hydrotherapy instruments. Sometimes we do not clean them properly. Then is the common treatment areas. If we do not have a cabin system, then is the water source. If the water source is not clean, then the contaminated equipments, mattresses, hands and apron area of the hospital staff. Uh, pathogenesis of the burn wound infection is the typical burn wound initially colonized predominantly with gram positive organisms like staph and all, and then antibiotic susceptible gram negative organisms within a week, they take over. After that, the wound closure, if it is further delayed, the patient becomes infected, requiring treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics. And of course, later on, because of the uh, dual reasons of long-term antibiotic, as well as patient's immunity going down, there is a yeast or fungi infection, which are quite antibiotic resistant. Then what about the lab diagnosis? Is it the VAP, uh, swab? which is uh, the diagnostic, or we need to have a tissue biopsy. So it has been seen that mostly people take a wound swab and that is quite diagnostic, but in patients where, they, where there's severe septicemia, in uh, the studies uh, which we conducted twice in our institute, about 100 cases each, the tissue biopsy culture revealed that in cases of septicemia, severe septicemia, there was a disparity between the wound uh, swab culture showing some bacteria and the deeper penetrated like uh, deep uh, tissue biopsy cultures, 15% of cases in septicemic cases, the um, bacteria identity was different. Uh, so the wound cultures should be taken at the time of admission and then at least twice a week, which is recommended. And uh, maybe taken if you are suspecting more infection, maybe taken more frequently. And then it may serve as the unsuspected uh, reservoir frost, frost transmission if we uh, means that we would like to know once the patient came in, he had no infection and later on he acquired infection from within the hospital. And method of wound culture is of course the standard uh, semi-quantitative swab as well as quantitative. The factors associated with improved outcome and infection prevention, they include of course the early burn uh, burly oxygen, then is the topical antibiotic therapy, then is the aggressive infection control measures. 
uh, one of the primary concern associated with burn injuries is the avascularity of the scar, which uh, preventing the immune cells and systematically administered antibiotics from being delivered to the infection site. So that is the major cause. And uh, there is no question now to say that whether early exchange should be done or not. Early exchange is the key to prevent infection and that is absolute yes. The early exchange debridement and skin grafting as soon as possible. And uh, systemic microbials, uh, uh, systemic antibiotics, there is a lot of uh, controversy. Some people, some school of thought, schools say that initial antibiotics should not be started, but while the others say that one single cephalosporin kind of antibiotic should be started. At our institute here, we do give initial antibiotics in the form of cephalosporins. In burns which are older than seven days, there's already a biofilm which is uh, detected there in these areas. And this is associated with chronicity of the wound and bacterial colonization is easier to eradicate in the first few days after injury. But after seven days, it becomes a bit difficult. Then signs of wound infection, uh, which are as follows, the suppurative separation of the scar, the graft loss, if it was done earlier, the change in the wound color, that the focal areas of red, brown, or black discoloration, then the green discoloration in uh, the subcutaneous fat. Then there are signs of cellulitis, which are as follows, erythema, induration, warmth, tenderness, and sepsis. So these all should be monitored every day by the uh, either the resident or the consultant and the uh, supporting staff. Then the signs of sepsis are follows uh, as follows, the increased temperature, progressive tachycardia, progressive tachypnea. So these are all uh, because of the systemic infl uh, inflammatory response by the body. And then the thrombocytopenia, hyperglycemia and inability to continue the enteral field. So if anyone or in combination they are uh, detected in the ward, it should alarm that the septic patient is going into septicemia. Then there are complications if the uh, right treatment or the aggressive treatment is not begun still by double antibiotics or broad spectrum antibiotics, then it can lead to pneumonia, septicemia, and later on multi-organ failure, which can lead to that. The major cause still in burns is the infection. So laboratory tests, which are there, of course, the TLC count, the hemogram, then the C-reactive protein, but these are not very, very specific. Then there's low albumin levels uh, if there is associated with higher incidence of the sepsis. Then of course the PCT level is uh, of more than uh, 0.56 per milliliter to have a reported sensitivity of 75% to 80%. So PCT level should be conducted in all the patients which can uh, have a sensitivity to declare that the patient is landing into septicemia. Then if there are any imaging study, of course not any imaging study diagnostic of uh, septicemia or infection. Of course, the chest x-ray will show progressive uh, ARDS or patches. Then st there are two stages uh, depending on the colonization, which include number one, stage one is superficial. The microorganisms are present only in burn wound surface. Then it's penetrating, which is variable depth of the penetration. Then it's proliferating, where there are variable levels of microbial proliferation at non-viable or viable tissues interface. Then stage two is when there is a micro invasion present in the viable tissue. Then deep invasion also present in the viable tissue, whence the viable tissue is uh, invading. So early empirical antibiotics, there are certain questions now after they, we learned all this. There are certain questions whether early empirical antibiotics should be started. Number two, either we should go only for swab culture or a tissue biopsy should be done. And of course, should be early diagnosis should be done. These three questions will be debated. Uh, so it has to be a team approach. The surgeon or plastic surgeon is, the, of course, the team leader. But the role of nurses and dressers, which can, uh, who can tell you that, look, doctor, there are certain uh, irregularities on the wound and they don't like it. So they would ask this house surgeon, resident, or the consultant. Then, of course, intensivist and microbiologist should be consulted at time to time. Uh, so the message is that be vigilant and detect infections early. If we can prevent, then it's the best thing. If we can detect early, we can aggressively treat them. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Sanjeev Appal. It was an excellent presentation on the principles of management of burn wound infection. And uh, uh, you've, you've covered everything. It's a very, very important topic. And this is something which you know just changes the prognosis in cases of burn wounds. Thank you so much. Next.
We are going to have a talk by Dr. Ravi Mahajan, who is the President-Elect of Association of Plastic Surgeons of India. And he would be going, and he will be speaking on principles of nanocrystalline silver dressing in management of burns. Dr. Ravi Mahajan, sir, please. Dr. Mahajan, your audio is not coming. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Mahajan, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. And first of all, I must thank uh, Rajiv for uh, giving this opportunity to interact uh, with the uh, large number of people today, Sunday morning. So I'll be talking about the principles of nanocrystalline silver dressing in management of uh, burns. And uh, all of us uh, know that the, as far as the use of silver as an antimicrobial uh, agent is concerned, it is there uh, in the treatment of burns for a very long time. And because of uh, its antimicrobial properties as well as the anti-inflammatory properties. And uh, it becomes biologically active whenever it is in soluble form in the form of AG plus or AG uh, zero. Uh, clusters and these free, free silver cations have a very potent antimicrobial action which destroys the microorganism immediately by blocking the cellular respiration and uh, also disrupting the function of the bacterial cell membrane. So this thing has been known to us for a very long time and in addition to the its potent antimicrobial action it has also shown to be non-toxic to the human tissues and it has some pro-healing properties as well as uh, anti-inflammatory properties. And uh, uh, we have been uh, using silver nitrate 0.5% which was introduced in 1960s by uh, Monafo and Moyer for burn, burn wound management and then later silver sulfidizing was introduced by Fox in 1968. And I think uh, since that time, it has been probably one of the most commonly used uh, topical uh, antibacterial agent as far as uh, the burns are uh, concerned. But then there has been certain disadvantages as far as uh, these products were concerned. And uh, as far as silver nitrate is concerned, it was needed to be applied several times a day. In fact, it had to be re-moistened every two hours to stay effective. And then nitrate can produce oxidant injuries. It uh, binds with chloride. It causes discoloration. And it was, uh, its application was quite painful. So uh, then silver sulfidizing came. And it has been on the scene for a very long time because of its advantages of ease of application. There was not as much uh, pain as it was there with the silver nitrate. And it could be applied less frequently. And uh, in fact, to be more effective, it uh, uh, had to be applied uh, twice a day. But most of us have been uh, using it uh, once a day. Uh, but then there were a lot of uh, disadvantages also as far as the sulfadiazine was concerned. One of those was that it can produce bone marrow suppression. It has some pro-inflammatory response. It is toxic to fibroblasts. And it can lead to propylene glycol toxicity. And it was allergic uh, reactions also in some of the patients uh, was noticed. But if you consider that if the pure silver is uh, made available, 
in fact the pure silver doesn't have any local or systemic toxicity because all these toxicities were related to the silver salts uh, that is silver nitrate and the silver sulfadiazine but the pure silver itself will not cause any systemic toxicity or any impairment of the healing so keeping into that into mind the nano crystalline silver dressings uh, they have been uh, developed and what is a nano crystalline silver it is in fact a cluster of extremely small that is 15 nanometer uh, uh, size particle which has the 30 to 50 atoms and it is highly reactive uh, uh, these highly reactive particles of silver they are created by nanotechnology and then they apply it on a mesh on each side and uh, then it is applied on the wound and if you have a smaller particles then the advantage is that the number of bacteria which will come in contact with that particle that will be much more so the uh, the bacterial kill is going to be much more as you can uh, see that there is a sustained release of these uh, silver ions which takes place when you moisten it with the sterile water and uh, the smith and nephew has produced acticoat which produces uh, controlled release of these clusters of silver cations over the wound for a period of 3 days and now they have come up with acticoat 7 which does it for 7 days so that is a, a, i think a big uh, uh, kind of a jump as far as the technology is concerned that it's not only that you have a pure silver available but that there is a uh, continuous release of those uh, silver ions which is taking place and that continues for a period of 3 days or 7 days depending upon uh, whether you are using simple acticoat or acticoat 7 and so you don't have to change uh, those dressings very frequently and here uh, i was talking about the size of the particles so you can see if the size of the particle is very large then the number of bacteria which will come in contact with this particle that will be less but if they are uh, broken into smaller particles then the number of bacteria which will come in contact will be very large so the bacterial rate will be uh, much more so the advantages of uh, the nano crystalline silver dressing is that uh, you have to change it less frequently as i said that there is a continuous release of the silver which is taking place and then it has a faster bacterial kill rate because of its smaller size and better uh, antimicrobial activity so it has a direct effect on the wound biology uh, thus uh, having a pro healing effect and it also controls the surface microbes the moist wound healing is maintained because we are putting it as wet and if need be we can continuously mummy bile sahab ne start making it wet and uh, the because you don't have to do the frequent uh, dressing changes to mechanical mummy bile sahab Uh, mechanical trauma to the wound uh, is not there because as we know that if there are frequent change of dressings the epithelialization process uh, which, uh, takes place so that gets disturbed so it also decreases the excess wound uh, inflammation also so what are the indications uh, where uh, one should use uh, this nano crystalline silver dressing Uh, it is mainly used in deep dermal to full thickness burns either you can use it prior to excision or you can use it after excision also in order to avoid infection even in the partial thickness burns which are very large and hey, potential i have already given no yeah, can you please uh, mute uh, all the uh, uh, all all the spectators so in partial thickness burns the role is when uh, there is a large uh, uh, area and then the chances of infection are there otherwise in partial thickness burns i think uh, any form of a dressing probably uh, if it is not a very large area uh, will lead to the healing of the wounds then you can use it even on donor sites to avoid infections and if you have put put a meshed skin graft it can be put over that also and uh, uh, over integra also now this uh, uh, nano crystalline silver dressing that is also being used uh, quite extensively in order to avoid any kind of infection uh, uh, with integra then another use which is outside burns and uh, which i have uh, actually used it uh, uh, a couple of times and that is in a uh, condition called tens and that there also we have found it very useful uh, to avoid infection because this is also a very uh, burn like condition you know which in which the mortality otherwise is very high i will just go through some of these patients this was a 14 year old patient with 65% uh, electrical burns and he had uh, uh, mixed uh, burns and you can see here from here that these are all deep dermal burns 
and uh, uh, if we were treating it conservatively uh, or even with the xcn we would have landed up uh, grafting it but now with the use of this uh, uh, nanocrest line silver dressing what dr raja was saying that if you are able to uh, avoid the uh, destruction of the deep dermal tissues then uh, you know the wound will either heal by itself or even if you have to put a graft then you are uh, saving the deep dermal tissue so in this case with the use of acticoat we were able to avoid infection and as a result of that the deep dermal tissue uh, damage that was avoided and this healed uh, uh, without any uh, you know problem whereas uh, the third degree burns uh, they uh, also granulated very well without any infection and uh, we were able to have uh, this patient healed uh, without any grafting in this area and the grafting was done only in the leg region which was uh, third degree burns so what i have seen is that if you are applying this nanocrystalline silver dressing uh, the chances of patient going into septicemia they reduce considerably the use of intravenous antibiotics that reduces considerably and since there are no episodes of fever the which the patient is having the patient's uh, uh, enteral intake that is also much better so the protein intake is better and they do much better so for hand uh, burns again you know we have found it very useful in deep dermal burns where you can uh, do without grafting and you can see that skin uh, totally since the infection has been avoided so if there is no infection there is not going to be much of the scarring also and you will have uh, soft supple scars and uh, which will do very well another 50 year old female with 40% burns and here again you can see that uh, these were all deep dermal burns and with the use of nanocrystalline silver uh, dressings uh, these all these wounds they healed uh, within a period of 3 weeks because otherwise uh, my, uh, i think i'm sure the experience of um, uh, myself and others would have been that these kind of wounds otherwise uh, will lead to granulation because of the destruction of the deep uh, dermal tissue but this lady healed completely uh, with, uh, without any uh, skin grafting and uh, you can see that uh, the uh, she has very supple uh, scars and not much of a hypertrophy also and this is another patient with 30% burns you know here again you know we had to uh, some of the wounds they healed and the others we were able to graft so no uh, fever episodes no uh, uh, chances of going into septicemia in most of the cases and then uh, uh, the intake of the patients uh, that also improves and which leads to uh, better healing so as far as the support evidence is concerned as far as uh, the uh, uh nano crystalline silver dressings are concerned uh i think uh, uh the uh, evidence is there in vitro studies in animal studies as well as in human studies as well and uh, as you can see uh, that uh, it, uh, the in vitro studies they have found it uh, effective against uh, all the multi resistant strains and the fungi and the uh, killing rate has also been found to be uh, uh, the best as far as uh, the nano crystalline silver dressing is concerned so there are a lot of references to that similarly in animal studies also they have found it very useful and uh, in a lot of human studies also the literature uh, review if you do you will find that uh, it uh, reduces the burn wound sepsis to a great extent frequency of dressing changes is of course reduced uh, greatly and uh, then uh, the it decreases the matrix metalloproteinase activity also and the uh, wound exudate bio burden all is reduced and it promotes uh, wound healing and uh, the best thing is that it has been found uh, that it is not toxic to keratinocytes or fibroblasts uh, which was there earlier with the other uh, silver salts the only thing uh, which has been uh, you know uh, which we find difficult particularly in indian scenario is the cost factor but uh, the cost studies have been done in the west so we don't though we don't have any indian studies and these studies have found out uh, that uh, eventually the cost actually comes out to be less if you are using uh, the nano crystalline silver dressings because the uh, uh, the rehabilitation of the patient may be earlier patient may not need surgery in many circumstances and uh, uh, the use of antibiotics may also be reduced to a great extent and similarly the nursing cost and the other also cost uh, that gets reduced so to conclude i would like to say that uh, the nanocrystalline cellular dressing is a very effective antimicrobial agent for treating burn wounds 
it reduces the inflammatory process and promotes healing it is less toxic at, as compared to other forms of silver dressings and it is it has no toxicity to keratinocyte and fibroblasts it is cost effective it has been found to be in studies and reduces the pain levels and has a longer wear time thus limiting the frequency of dressing changes and there are no reports of resistance uh, to the nanocrystalline silver dressing thank you so much Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi Mahajan, for your excellent lecture on the principles of use of nanocrystalline silver dressings in the management of burns, and probably the nanocrystalline silver dressings, their use has revolutionized the management of burns because of the great advantages they have. Thank you so much. Next, we have Dr. Sunil Keswani from Mumbai. He is going to speak on principles of management of burns in COVID-19 scenario. As we all know, we are going under this pandemic, and there are a lot of issues with that. So, Dr. Keswani is going to speak on the principles of management of burns in COVID-19 scenario. Dr. Keswani, please. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for uh, permitting me to speak on this particular topic because. With the presence of COVID, there are slight uh, changes which we have to be made in the management of burn patients because of two reasons. One, uh, COVID as per uh, even normal people can get COVID, but burn patient being immunocompromised, the chances of uh, uh, acquiring the coronavirus is uh, much higher. And the risk is from uh, various sources. One, either from the, the patient directly acquires from the relatives or from the staff members or uh, 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 overall from fomites which are there in the uh, burn uh, unit. Um, now, as the coronavirus gnaws its way across India, Mumbai has suffered the worst. This city of 20 million is now an epicenter of this disease and now responsible for 20% of India's coronavirus infections and uh, nearly 25% of the deaths day after day. We have observed that during this phase of uh, uh, COVID, uh, the industrial burns are down because industries are not working and domestic burns and scal burns are up possibly because the men folk and the children are at home <coughs> and more cooking is being done to satisfy the needs of the people at home. And overall numbers of uh, indoor patients are down. Routine surgeries are not being performed. As a general policy, every new patient to a burn unit and his relative has to be considered as a potential COVID patient and appropriate preventive and protective measures are taken, which I am sure everybody is aware of by now. Uh, as far as relatives go, we try to restrict the number of relatives accompanying the burn patient to only one per patient if it's an outpatient. Uh, outpatients are called in only if there are acute burns or with wounds which require dressing which cannot be managed at home by the patient's relatives. If they're small wounds, the relatives are taught how to do the dressings and they manage the wounds at home and send pictures on WhatsApp. Uh, if the patient is hospitalized, only one relative stays with the patient, no visitors allowed to go, come in and go out. The relatives are made aware of the precautions to be taken in terms of washing hands and wearing protective masks and spacing out the OPD timing so that there's no crowding during OPDs and social distancing is maintained to prevent the transfer of the disease. As far as staffing goes, arrangements have been made uh, in our hospital, uh, we can be telling you what we have done, changes we have done to prevent the uh, transfer of the disease. Arrangements have been made to house most of the staff in the hospital premises so that not many staff mem members come from home. Training programs of the staff regarding COVID-19 and the protective and preventive measures to be taken, hand washing, social distancing, uh, donning and doffing of the PP, these uh, uh, ongoing programs on a weekly basis are being conducted. Uh, uh, training programs are also being conducted to ensure more staff are aware of, aware of methods of non-invasive ventilation, invasive ventilation, apart from the ICU staff which are already there. This is just to ensure that there's a backup team available just in case some of our ICU staff uh, acquire or contract with the COVID disease. Rotation of staff being done since the staff is staying a shorter hours and break duty wherever possible because it has been said that uh, Longer hours with the PPE are very difficult to manage and uh, uh, also the efficiency of the staff uh, goes down. So four hour duty followed by a break again, followed by a four hour duty. This is the donning and doffing protocol which have been put up all over the hospital and can be put up by all the burn units so that the people are aware of the particular technique of putting it on and particular technique of putting it off so that you 
you don't get infected neither do you put others at risk yeah. uh, there are certain additional instrumentation which are uh, we have found useful from the literature that we have been reading on it is the use of uh, non invasive ventilators non invasive ventilators have uh, been found to be more useful in case of uh, covid disease in case your burn patient acquire the disease rather than intubating them if they can maintain their saturation with a non invasive ventilator you don't really have to put the patient intubate the patient and put on ventilator uh nebulizers are to be avoided because they generate aerosol so fixed dose inhalers are to be used instead of nebulizers as far as possible high flow nasal cannulas are special devices which give uh, high flow uh, or na nasal oxygen from 6 to 26 to 30 liters per minute and they are found to be very very effective uh, in uh, 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 along with uh, either as a substitute for non invasive ventilation or as a substitute for invasive ventilation wherever the saturation can be maintained with uh, high flow nasal cannulas video laryngoscopy has found to be very useful in intubations wherever intubations are required either as an emergency in the icu or uh, in, while intubating for a surgery and uh, this avoids direct exposure of the anesthesiologist to the patient's breathing and the uh, uh, acrylic box has found to be useful which uh, is easily available at least in bombay i'm sure it's available all over the country and with the video laryngoscope the anesthetist can have a look at where the uh, uh, vocal cords are and how to go about the intubation either directly with the endotracheal tube or with the use of a stylet all skin banking activities have been put on hold in india all organ donations have been tentatively put on hold by the zonal transplant coordination committee zttc it's not safe to go to people's houses or mortuaries or hospital icus to have a skin for fear of covid both to the staff to the relatives who are there and uh, uh, we are not sure of the yet of the protocols of how to uh, uh, ensure the safety of the recipient in case skin is harvested from a, even a non covid patient he may be an asymptomatic carrier uh, there are special protocols being formulated which maybe in a subsequent webinar we could be we could discuss that the donor covid status is difficult to assess so we are trying to work out these protocols as i mentioned surgeries only emergency surgeries in burns limited elective surgeries covering all fresh burn cases biological dressings so that the frequency of dressings is reduced acticoat we have found to be useful even otherwise and i agree with uh, dr ravi majan that acticoat uh, uh, is used and we don't have to change it frequently so the exposure of the patient and the staff to each other uh, will will be reduced in the visits to the uh, ot will be reduced for the dressings the chance of cross infection are also reduced with acticoat early excisions have been put on hold due to shortage of skin allografts uh, and the number of surgical pro procedures we try to reduce so that the less surgery is being done less chances of acquiring covid especially for the anesthesiologist so at the time of intubation and extubation the least number of people remain inside the ot so that uh, but that's the time when the maximum aerosol generation is happening at the time of intubation and we try to do as much as possible in one operation This is the flow chart suggesting COVID-19 testing protocol for planned surgical patients in burns. A PCR testing and antibody testing uh, uh, should uh, become mandatory if the patient is PCR negative and antibody positive. That means the patient is well uh, well immunized. The disease has come and almost gone. The surgery can be carried out. No testing in the duration of stay, and even at discharge, no exit test is required. If the patient is PCR negative and antibody negative, that means patient has still not got the disease. One can carry out the surgery. PCR testing will have to be done during the stay, period of stay, and every six to seven days, because the patient is in the window period, the PCR may come positive later on. And at discharge, an exit PCR test should should be done so that uh, the patient knows that patient was COVID negative when he left the hospital, and the blame does not come on the hospital for transmitting COVID to the patient. And the last uh, possible combination is PCR positive and antibody negative. We have to postpone the surgery because it has been found that. Uh, patients who are a pcr positive antibody negative uh, in the active phase the complication rate of the surgeries is much higher patient don't do that well the grafts don't do well and the recovery is not so it is better to wait for 4 5 days let the pcr become negative and the antibody start becoming positive that's the time to go in for surgery uh anesthesia intubations generally try to avoid more of regional anesthesia intubate with full relaxation dose intubate with acrylic box intubate with video laryngoscope and extubate the patient try to extubate the patient deeper plane of anesthesia to avoid the patient struggling and coughing where more aerosols are likely to be generated and chances of infection are higher 
to conclude the burns management in the post covid era will need all of us to make changes in our treatment protocols as per our infrastructure and availability of staff personnel and instrumentation as we go along we're all on a learning curve and each one of us will have to customize a protocol depending upon our infrastructure both in terms of personnel equipment and finances i think it is only by sharing our thoughts ideas and protocols with each other will we be able to move faster and more efficiently the new protocols to save the lives of burn patients without compromising the safety of our burn team thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you dr keswani uh, you have spoken on a very very relevant subject which is the issue of managing burns in this corona pandemic and you have shown how to organize things how to do dressings and how to do how to organize things in the operating room and what precautions to take and what are the protocols in these management thank you for a very nice lecture now we go on to the uh, panel discussion and we have lots of questions the questions are in the chat box the are also in whatsapp so it is up to you whether you take this question from the chat or maybe you can ask any i think i have got the questions noted down somebody noted down the questions for me i think we'll put it to the panel uh, i think raja you are there sanjeev you are there and ravi you are there yeah first question is what can be done to decrease blood loss to, during debridement do the, do all of you infiltrate the donor site and the recipient site if yes what is the yeah. kind of line adrenaline solution that you use yeah raja sabati please yeah what we do is whenever it's possible to use the tunicate and we use the tunicate so uh, that's uh, that's the first step and uh, secondly our team you know infiltrate you know, almost the tumicin solution that we use for a uh, same thing we uh, sign with adrenaline you know we infiltrate into the very very low doses and i think what is really even if you inject pure saline uh, like uh, uh, it serves as a homeostatic uh, we do inject uh, and uh, during excision and it does not in no way um, uh, make it difficult for you to assess the depth of burns and i would say we are using the tunicate is one of the most important things for leg, leg burns and if you are exercising it very early i think in the first 24 hours it doesn't bleed it really it bleeds very really less mm -hmm. i think dr keshwani mm -hmm. also will attest to that fact uh ravi majan unmute yourself ravi Yeah, please, yeah I think the, uh, I think it's the same thing. You know, in limbs, uh, uh, we always try to use tunicate because uh, that is very helpful to reduce the bleeding. And uh, for other areas where you cannot put tunicate, then you have to do the infiltration. And infiltration we do usually with the almost the same solution which we use uh, for liposuction. So I think that reduces uh, the bleeding to a great extent. What is the concentration then, that you use, Ravi? Yeah, uh, this is uh, uh, one in ten lakh. Yeah. How many ampules of adrenaline and how many liters of saline? Just to simplify yeah, in, for the audience. Yeah, yeah. in one in one liter of uh, saline, uh, we will be putting only one ampule. So because it is in one thousand, so that will make it one in ten lakhs. Sanjeev, what about you? What's the protocol that you follow? Uh, for debridement or the uh, infiltration? Infiltration to de decrease blood loss. Yeah, yeah, infiltration. It is the same, uh, uh, but we are using a bit of higher concentration, and we usually in, in two two point five lakhs, one in two point five lakhs. And right. Two, yeah, like that. Yeah, in our center at the National Burn Center, we are using two ampules mm -hmm. and one liter of saline. And even if you use two liters of saline, we don't see any systemic side effects in terms of tachycardia and all that because due to vasoconstriction, not too much of it gets absorbed. So I think we are quite okay with that. Sir. The next question is uh, to uh, Ravi. Uh, Ravi, uh, uh, Dr. Raghav has asked that nanocrystalline dressings do do they need to be changed daily? Can you answer that again? You have mentioned it in your talk, but it's nice to reiterate. No, 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 no. That is the best thing. You don't have to change it daily. Uh, you just need to change it uh, mm -hmm. uh, every three days. And uh, then now, since the Acti Code Seven is also available, so you can keep it even up to seven days. but as far as the moistening is concerned uh, you know if the wound is little exudating that it may remain moist but otherwise uh, you have to remove the upper dressing and then moisten it with the distal water uh, uh, frequently so that it remains moist because uh, the release of the silver will take place only uh, if it is moistened uh, uh, remains moistened otherwise it will not 
Yeah. Question for Dr. Raja, is it necessary yeah. to give splintage in each patient uh, mm -hmm. or if there's a wound over the joint? Yeah, that's right. No, so when you have a hand burn and it will be in the initial period, it will be edematous. And if someone says, no, you need to give it exactly like yeah, the way you, you, you are splinted. Yeah, I think so. I think everybody else knows, no, please. Yeah. So if you... you so if the you participants, say, please, please mute your microphones, please. Participants, to please mute your microphones. Thank you. Yeah, Raja, continue, please. Yeah. So suppose if you say that you need to uh, keep, keep it in the exactly the same way as that of a hand, it's not be possible because edema. So what we will try to do one is keep the hand elevated, and second, as much as possible, you know, keep it flexed and the MCP joint flex and do it. And as the edema goes down, which usually goes, if you make them flex, I think if you ask them to keep moving, you will find that the dorsum of the skin, you know, it's always contracted. The edema comes down. I think that's what now we should, we'll be doing that. Okay, the, at least, and then also keep the thumb web space, you know, you put some gauze pieces over there and do that. And it's not really necessary to put a lot of gauze pieces in between, you know, because if you put it in between, the edema, because of the edema, the lot of, you know, a lot more pressure comes in. So I think that would be the thing. Anji, what is your protocol? Do all joints have to be splinted or only hand joints and do you, do you splint in your unit? No, no, we, what we exactly do is uh, on the third day onwards, we start so with the physiotherapy, active physiotherapy. And then, then the physiotherapy is done either twice a day minimum. And then after the physiotherapy and especially at night time, the joint, all the joints are splinted. And the hand joints are uh, given uh, either uh, we, sometimes we had even done a study that the hands were put in a polythene bag, which is freshly taken polythene bag and then put the hands in and let the uh, physiotherapy or the hand movements continue. At night time, of course, the splintage is done for all the joints, including hands. Dr. Rajiv, what's, what's your protocol at your center? Well, for splinting, uh, the same as Dr. Upal said, that uh, after 48 hours, we start some movement so that, you know, the stiffness, the incidence of stiffness is reduced and nighttime splintage is given while in the daytime supervised physiotherapy is done for all these patients post-operatively. Uh, Ravi, uh, what is your opinion and what yeah. is your protocol? Yeah, I think uh, all the three things are important. Elevation, uh, physiotherapy, as well as the splinting. So all these three things uh, have to uh, continue when we start doing it right from the beginning. The elevation is there and then uh, uh, you do the splinting and the physiotherapy is done at least twice a day uh, when you remove the splints and uh, do the physiotherapy. Otherwise, they remain in splint uh, uh, all the time. Uh, for whatever joints they are involved. So if it is a uh, axilla which is involved, so we'll give them uh, a aeroplane splint. And for hand, of course, uh, try to give them the cock-up splints. So all three things uh, uh, have to continue uh, um, at the same time, you know, at different intervals. How soon do you mobilize the patients and make them ambulant, Ravi, irrespective of the percentage of burns? Uh, because in long term, long immobilization has its own problems. So what is your protocol? Uh, mobilizing out of the bed. Out of the bed, ambulation. You see, uh, we try to start it as early as possible, which is uh, usually uh, after about three days. So we try to get them out of the bed because the initial 48 to 72 hours, it may not be possible. But I think once the resuscitation is uh, has been done and they're doing well, so we try to take them out of the bed. Uh, but even during the initial time also, we try to make them sit, make them sit at least and uh, do some uh, the movements of the limbs. So, but the Raja, what's your protocol yeah. for ambulation? Yeah. yeah, if the patients have not been uh, actually excised in the first 48 hours, if they are excised, that means we are grafted, then they take longer. But then if they are not excised, they initially, I think as early as possible, after 48 hours, when the resuscitation phase is complete, and after that, they move. So I was moving it a little bit later, but then uh, the you know, younger people, you know, Sanjay, Mesh, they all not do it you know, much faster. They are uh, taking them to a bath and then they're doing it now, much earlier nowadays. Sanjeev, what's your protocol? Yeah, for the burns where the lower limbs are not actually involved and the percentage is uh, lesser, maybe less than 40, we start the uh, patient make ambulatory on fourth or fifth day, like anything after three days. And once the patient's general condition is fit, the BPs and all those things are controlled. And the for patients whose lower limbs are involved, 
then we try to make them sit only four to day within the bed and within bed movements are maintained then the patient is taken out of the bed and uh, put on a chair for initially for a day or two and then made gradually to stand and move this is for the patient who is more than 50% burns unstable and the patient's lower limbs are quite badly injured otherwise the if it is upper limb chest and all and the patient is cleared by the intensives that he can be made to stand and there will be no uh, fluctuation in the blood pressures and all then only we will take uh, patient ambulatory otherwise within bed the patient is encouraged to move rajiv what is your protocol well i do agree with dr uppal the prime factor is the involvement of the lower extremities so if the lower extremities are normal they have not been uh, crafted they have they are not burned then the patients can be made ambulatory after 48 hours like if if it is just the upper limb we can start doing that but if the lower limbs are involved then we'll have to wait for some time maybe 48 to 36 hours or maybe 72 hours and then start mobilization for these patients mm -hmm. Oh, as far as if the mobilization is not done early enough, uh, what is your protocol, Rajiv, for low molecular weight heparins or crystalline heparin? Do you have a protocol for this because the incidence of DVT in uh, lower limbs in burns with long-standing uh, immobilization is very high, and uh, right. the studies which show that a uh, lot of people are using routine uh, low molecular weight heparins. So, what is your protocol at your center? Well, at uh, regarding this, we have to see other factors. what is the age of the patient and especially for geriatric patients and if the patient have got other uh, morbidities the, the patient has got other problems polycythemia or or other systemic problems then we start them on clexane or some other kind of a agent along with low molecular weight uh, therapy to to take care of the dvts but if the patient is a adult patient if the patient is a younger patient then maybe we don't have to do much more of this therapy Raja, what is your protocol for uh, yeah, anticoagulation? Yeah, our, our intensive routine, routine, or you customize the protocol? Yeah, I think mostly it's routine. Unless the EP are not giving, I think they must have an answer for it. You know, unless you know, there is a reason for not giving, I think our intensivists are uh, keen on uh, giving clexane. So that's what is the protocol. And even for, uh, but uh, personally, I feel more than all that uh, the mobilization is very important. I think if you are able to give very nursing care. Uh, making the ankle move up and down, I think which you have to do regimentally. If you could do that, I think that would be the most important uh, determinant which prevents all these pulmonary co complications. One, and uh, secondly, coupled with that, along with that, more early mobilization. Now, both of them will uh, do it up very well. But along with that, giving uh, collection, I think it's it, it another uh, extra padding for you to do that. And giving flexion does not in no way affect our uh, regular surgical part of it. Uh, it doesn't really uh, affect uh, whether you are doing a uh, excision or grafting. It does not uh, affect that. Ravi, what's your anticoagulation pro protocol? Yeah, we are not using it uh, for each and every patient. Only in uh, older individuals uh, with major burns. But I think more stress is on uh, mobilization. Uh, even if uh, they are in the bed, so we encourage them to. Uh, um, uh, to do a lot of movements of the ankle and the legs, uh, but in older patients, yes, we do. Not in every. Uh, right, uh, Sanji, what's the your take on this? Yeah, our take is that our institutional policy as well as our unit policy have been, and uh, we prefer to give it in all, almost all cases, because we are not monitoring the DVT in by doing Doppler studies and all, and it has been mentioned in few studies, not very extensive studies at all. that later on there uh, the dvt uh, the patient once coming for follow up even then also we are not checking uh, the dvt in those cases by carrying out the doppler studies so during the period of admission uh, until the patient is fully mobile we do give uh, this uh, low molecule heparin to all the patients except of course the few children Yeah, I think all of us agree that good hydration, early ambulation, early mobilization is the key to preventing deep vein thrombosis. And uh, I think uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, one can decide if the patient is not being mobilized early. One can start low molecular heparins. We do start low molecular heparins. And as Dr. Raja said, you don't really have to stop it. 24 hours is an enough gap for uh, 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 if uh, uh, the surgery being planned the next day. The next day, if you don't give the Low molecular heparin really doesn't make any change in the amount of bleeding that happens. 
Another question which has come from Dr. Ravi Chandran, which says that high flow nasal cannulas can infect others, can be used spaces. Uh, it has been found that the incidence of uh, uh, infection with high flow nasal cannulas and aerosol generation is much less, but use of spacers will definitely prevent this and is very, very useful because it provides a closed system by which you can do it. That's a very good suggestion from Dr. Ravi Chandran. And uh, one more question from Dr. Trivedi is, even non-invasive ventilators like CPAP and BiPAP have been found to create large amounts of aerosol and infection risk to attending staff. This again, I've been doing a lot of reading and we have found that yeah, it is true that uh, CPAP and BiPAP uh, 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 does create a lot of aerosol. That's why high flow nasal cannulas are preferred to uh, CPAP and BiPAP. And CPAP and BiPAP are preferred to intubation and ventilation. Uh, do uh, you all agree, Raji? What's your take on this? Well, uh, we have to take the maximum precautions while the, these patients are being intubated and while these patients are being operated. Yes, spacers is a very good idea and a very good option. And we have to minimize the number of OT staff which are there in the operating room at the time of surgery. And we have to, even at the time of intubation, the surgical team may stay outside and not go inside the OT. So these are some of the things which have to be taken into, into consideration while operating on these patients. Uh, uh, Rajiv, while we are with you, can we ask you another question? How has the incidence of burns during this COVID period is that incidence gone down? Is the number of incidents of particular type of burn gone up? What is your uh, center uh, uh, statistics? Well, that's a very good and a, that's a very interesting question. And the incidence of burns has drastically gone down and people are keeping safe at home. We did have few patients, but those were some staff patients who had some incidental burn because of spillage of hot liquid. But otherwise, the incidence of burns, I mean, has drastically gone down during this period in my area. Raja, in Coimbatore? Yeah, in Coimbatore, uh, the industrial burns and the other burns have gone down, but we had a number of children with skulls. One-year-old child, 25% burn. Two-year-old child having 30% burns. Uh, no, we received uh, children because they are all at home, I think. So that uh, the children burns are a little high. Oh, and to the, part, to the part of the about the protection, uh, early part of the COVID when it came, we bought about 12 acrylic boxes uh, for intubation. So our anesthetist, anesthetist used it for some time and later on everyone uh, decided that personal protection for them is the most important and they all bought that the 3M care. Now I think you see that uh, it's costing you 12,000. It's almost like a space suit. You can't even hear what they're talking. So we found that more than protecting this, as much as you protect the patient, that's fine. In addition to that, you the most important thing, you protect yourself. So all of them I got uh, personally, they, you, each one of them I bought for individually. Is important. They are using that uh, maxillofacial cases or any every head and neck case, and uh, anesthetists who are intubating uh, major facial trauma, uh, head injuries, they all use it at that time. Otherwise, Ravi, they use a three ply mask. Thanks, Raja. Ravi, what is the incidence? How has the incidence been in Amritsar? Yeah, incidence has reduced <coughs> considerably actually. Uh, in fact, we got just some scaled burns in children and some of the electrical burns, in fact, we had, I think, with men folk at home, <clears throat> probably, I think they were uh, particularly in rural areas, you know, they were trying to, uh, high voltage electrical burns, uh, I'm talking, but otherwise regular burns, they're quite reduced. <laughs> Sanjeev, what is your uh, yeah, experience? At, at this moment, the severe burns are very much reduced. For smaller burns, even the patients don't prefer to come to the hospital because they fear that <laughs> the COVID patients are already there in the hospital will catch the cross infection. So they would like to go for those areas. And before we end, uh, I would like to wish as president of the National Academy of Burns a special congratulations to Dr. Rajiv and all the speakers, my senior and junior colleagues. There's no junior, of course, all my contemporary except Dr. Rajiv, who is a brilliant uh, fellow who's been uh, organizing such activities. Thank so you. on thank behalf you. of the National Academy of Burns India, uh, I wish to thank everybody on my behalf as well as from the entire organization. Rajiv, do and we have time for more questions or uh, do we stop here? We can, take, we can take two, three, four more questions. Right. Like, Sanjeev, you were saying something. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would just like to um, get into things that we might... Uh, 
be holding some more seminars uh, on this pattern like the acute kidney injury is one thing where we uh, in burns especially which we are not very much aware of and uh, we are of course coordinating with nephrologists and intensivists on that but we must learn these things because at some places only the surgeons are available who are tackling all these things and also we would be launching a major preventive campaign a coordinated one at places everybody is doing their bit but the national academy of burns wishes mm -hmm. that we let us have a coordinated national level preventive burns preventive program so we are looking forward to more academic activities like this thank you very much uh, another very relevant question that somebody has asked is should we uh, the, while changing the active code sometimes active code gets adherent to the wound then do we then peel it off or do we allow it to remain raja what is your do you have yeah, experience yeah. in active code i think we allow it to remain i think if you are correct i agree yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah ravi what's your experience yeah i think uh, you can just wet it uh, uh, again you know with the distilled water and keep it there you know let it peel off uh, when the epithelialization has taken place right so sanjeev what's your experience the uh, same uh, we continue to be at least for 5 days and yeah. uh, then we accordingly see the dressing and the aggregate coming out and then change rajiv so there's a very pertinent question and i myself have have observed the acticoat really sticking to the wound the best way to peel it off is to wet with either distilled water or with saline because once you do that it is easy to peel it off otherwise it becomes very painful uh, do you really need to peel it off because yeah, i have yeah, found yeah. that if you try yeah. to peel it off the epithelium comes off and yeah. you recreate another wound so very often, many times it is worthwhile unless there is a bad smell or the patient is showing yeah, yeah. signs of sepsis i think it would be worthwhile to uh, make a little attempt a is a feeble attempt to peel it off with saline if it comes off cool but if it doesn't come off it can be very well left in place that means you don't need to do further change of uh, acticoat dressing that means the wound is already epithelializing you agree yeah, with that right yeah, yeah. 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 uh somebody has asked a very very important question we'll ask uh, sanjeev that question first uh, sanjeev is the president of the national academy of burns for this year and uh, i think pain management should form a very very important part of burn management and it is said that patients do not allow physiotherapy to be done if there is severe pain happening so what is the pain management protocol sanjeev in your center yes uh, uh, in terms of uh, resting pain procedural pain and breakthrough pain if you could categorize generally yes the pain control is the very much uh, primary concern in the burns as burns are really painful as if somebody attempts a suicide and later on he commented that i never knew that it is such a painful procedure so otherwise i could have attempted something else so uh, the pain control right from the beginning the it was uh, we have conducted two large studies 100 uh, patients each and tramadol in uh, combination with paracetamol has been the uh, best solution for pain which is moderate in intensity of course for severe pains occurring we have uh, with the uh, infusion pumps we give uh, graded uh, fentanyl and uh, even for uh, very few patient now morphine as available only in icus that is also given and we have a very uh, as i learned from the your national burn center only that intensivist is involved right from the beginning and the pain control people from anesthesia they are also taking rounds with us uh, at least once in 3 days the pain control so the ravi what's your protocol yeah i think one thing which is very important uh, i think which all of us should uh, uh, try to do is that involvement of the anesthesiologist Uh, in the management of burns not only for intensive care for, for but for pain management also so we uh, all our patients in the burn unit in fact they are uh, regularly uh, you know seen by the anesthesiologist and uh, in our team of anesthesia we have people who are intensivists as well as uh, you know uh, one or two of them specialize in the pain management so we take their help but uh, generally uh, you know we rely upon the oral uh, combination of uh, tramadol and paracetamol only uh, most of the time but uh, if uh, there is a pain is more then of course we take their help and then they use those uh, infusion pump and uh, give uh, the combination of various uh, uh, these uh, uh, opiates uh, they can be used thanks ravi uh, raja what is your protocol for pain management yeah, for yeah, resting yeah, yeah. pain and procedural pain yeah. yeah in our hospital as ravi said uh, from the day of arrival to the day of discharge anesthetists are also making rounds 
um, along with them no, our team is the total uh, team so uh, 100% of the time they only take care of uh, pain and they take it take care of it really uh, very well and i am also the view that uh, some of now we should be like somebody asked about physiotherapy uh, i think that's a very important thing you know so at no time when they do therapy it must be painful i think if they having pain that means that's the one thing which causes uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy and all that uh, it gets on to a negative cycle i tell them now that whole thing has to be a very pleasant experience if you never force any burn patient to have pain and then move you know i think they must only move uh, actively do you may must do as much as they can and then you passively assist them a little bit till it causes pain and ask them to hold it that way so that means what we call as a active movement passive assist and hold so active passive assist and hold so in every day what you will find is you go through about 5 degrees 10 degrees you will be uh, gaining extra never force any patient to have pain i think that's a very important thing rajiv what's your protocol yeah pain control is one of the most important uh, thing to take care while uh, managing the patient with burns and especially the pain is more if the amount of burn is also more so in my center as dr upal said and dr mahajan said the pain control is taken care by the intensivist and the pain control anesthesiologist which are part of our team so what i am doing is for burns like full extremity burns or anything the patients are giving iv morphine in regulated doses 5 minutes before the dressing we are giving morphine and then the dressing is being done under the cover of morphine analgesia and i assure it's a completely painless dressing and the patient is quite comfortable so that is what we have been using for management of dressings especially big dressings in large burns so i think the consensus is that pain management is a very very important and integral part of burn management and uh, once you relieve pain then the patient is more positive in the outlook and the desire to survive also comes back physiotherapy becomes easier Uh, when pain is relieved, especially for chest burns, patient can take deeper breaths, and chance of fatal lactases and pneumonias go down. So again, when pain is relieved, patient is willing to mobilize himself and ambulate also much faster. So the hazards accompanying uh, long-term uh, immobilization also get reduced. So there are many fold uh, effects. All of us have agreed that pain management should be an integral part. Each center would have to have its own pain management protocol. and which works best for them depending upon their infrastructure in terms of finances personnel availability of anesthesiologists and things like that uh one another important related question is what is the role of uh, respiratory exercises chest physiotherapy uh, and uh, uh, nebulization and vibration which is to be done uh, raja what is the protocol for chest pt yes. so from day one I, like i would like to add here that the commonness cause of death in burns is not burn wound sepsis there are studies to show that the commonness cause of death in burns is hypostatic pneumonias and nosocomial pneumonias rather than burn wound sepsis so taking care of the chest is as important or more important than wound management raja over to you for the yeah yeah uh, very important because most people die due to lungs you know that's our uh, have been our experience so from day one uh, we have the physiotherapist teams doing that and then uh, we rounds in intensive care with even during the time of uh, the resuscitation phase and later uh, every time at the time of dressing change also they are also they join us there and then we give them the balls to blow up and that's, that's a very inspira experiment is very very uh, important they blow it up and then there is something to for them to achieve you know they have made one ball go up and next day two balls three balls like that so you have to inspire the spirometry i think that's very very important you need to have uh, something for these fellows to measure up to and look up to that that we have found the best uh, ravi what's your protocol for chest pt yeah again you know the physiotherapists whenever they come one of the things which they have to do in all major burns patient is to give them chest physiotherapy and then of course spirometry is uh, uh, you know that is the standard which we uh, uh, do in all the patients so chest physiotherapy is very very important and the physiotherapists uh, are briefed that they have to do it for all the patients uh, uh, twice a day at least sanjeev yeah uh, we uh, do have uh, the spirometry is done three times a day and the chest physiotherapy is done by tapping and all those things vibration roll uh, at least once a day and in cases where it requires it is twice a day also this is uh, of course except the patient who are on ventilator and all 
and uh, then we uh, we think that uh, there was a comment that it's uh, the death rate is not due to infection and only due to the chest kind of thing so but the uh, that is not exactly the textbook answer the infections do take over and then there is a element of the inhalation injury in all such cases which of course lead to uh, more susceptibility to infection the chest of course gets involved in continuation with the general uh, septicemia so it is not only the chest which kills the patient chest as subsequently uh, the things are moving from the infection second thing is in the uh, which has not been so far mentioned i'm not sure sunil is going to mention this or not is the nosocomial thing in studies conducted in our institute we had seen that our own staff members nurses doctors and uh, other paramedics this hand sanitization is uh, the tune of 60 to 70 percent only even the doctors taking rounds are not sanitizing their hands in every patient so that is one thing which should be very much followed thank you right rajiv rajiv well, uh, these things i think are more... yes sir these yeah, things i think are more important because the plastic surgeon role is uh, limited to seeing the dressings and everything but these ancillary management like physiotherapy respiration therapy all these things they, have, they should be done round the clock and this is what is a game changer in improving the results for these burn patients a very interesting question do electric dermatomes generate aerosols dr satish is asking that raja what is your take on that especially in covid times you want to generate minimum aerosol so do you use uh, hambi's knife or do you use electric dermatomes uh, we have used you know, dermatomes but i really didn't think uh, i didn't think about it now whether they cause not not more aerosols but as i told you know that the surgeon is well protected that is more important i think protect the surgeon than doing all this uh, that's what because we are doing uh, head and neck surgery maxilla facial surgery we are uh, putting plates and screws in the face all that is being done so naturally the amount of aerosol that we produce is much lesser with lt dermato but you are it far away so right. but in the... in burns where you are not using drills otherwise uh, i think electric dermatomes would definitely generate aerosol <laughs> visa visa ambi's knife ravi what is your take on this never thought about this good question <laughs> i also didn't think about it <laughs> yeah. ravi well, well i think uh, i i think that's a good thought uh, it can create more uh, aerosol and wherever you can manage with uh, ambi's knife then why do take a chance Correct. so i think uh, better to avoid uh, under these circumstances anjeev yeah of course it will generate aerosols that is agreed upon but at uh, places like in intubation protocols and all those things they have created a tent kind of thing where a polythene uh, curtain is on all the sides and if you need to use the i think the electric dermatome you can create a tent which covers the thigh part and all if you have to take uh, the uh, graft and then use that uh, under that rajiv what rajiv yeah go ahead i have no answer to that question whether the dermatome generates more aerosol or is it more safer to use hambi's knife but i feel that if it is a busy burn unit then see we need to take care of our equipment we need to sanitize the equipment we need to cover the plastic and so many things so i think it would be more practical to use the hambi's knife as regards the dermatome especially in a busy burn center but really if if it generates more uh, aerosol i have no idea about that one more very interesting question ravi i think you should answer that since you spoke on uh, silver impregnated dressing the question is do you need to make small holes in the active port to allow the exudate to come out yeah we, uh, sometimes we do you know particularly if we are using it on some exudating wounds so we do make holes uh, uh, sometimes because what i have seen is there if there is too much of exudation Uh, particularly because generally we start using nanocrystalline silver right from the beginning so in those cases uh, in fact uh, the there is hardly any you know kind of infection underneath but if you are using it a little later and already you know some amount of exudation is taking place so then it, I, I, we do sometimes you know make holes so that it comes out so because the mechanism of action of the nanocrystalline silver is that the exudate has to come into the silver dressing and then only the silver ions get released so some amount of exudate is required for the silver to be released you there is adequate there is no exudate 
basically as you said the dressing has to be wetted yeah but so, uh, uh, even if you make certain holes it's not that uh, it's not going to wet the dressing it will still wet the uh, dressing enough uh, to release the uh, silver ions uh, but at the same time there will be no collection uh, underneath so we we can make uh, holes and we do sometimes uh, sanjeev there is a question uh, uh, asking can nabi make a plain control protocol and guidelines for its members uh, please repeat sure. the question uh, can nabi national academy of burns since you are the president can it make a plain control guideline for its members Yes, yes. Of course, the pain control has been discussed in uh, quite a recent, and we will uh, create a pain control guide. Of course, we can do that. But then there will be options yeah. that uh, people can always vary, like the Parkland formula. So the availability of an intensivist backup from an anesthetist will, uh, of course, be required for uh, more. Uh, you see, using of more of the um, kind of opioids and further. the fentanyls and all there is a guideline that an anesthetist should be at hand available if you are using these kind of ketamines and all those things of course people are using in even centers like national burn center has their protocol and every place has its own protocol mixing few painkillers along with the opiates and sedatives and even they give it continuously 24 hours uh, is being are being given but you do have intensivist and anesthetist at the back for even medical legal reasons using these kind of uh, pain control measures we should have an anesthetist available in the hospital rajiv there is one question which says please highlight when to use collagen when to use acticot well that's a difficult one <laughs> uh, acticot <clears throat> as we all know has got very good antibacterial properties and therefore this type of dressings should be preferred especially in those burns which are signs of burn wound infection otherwise collagen dressings are the dressings which which should be used routinely for managing all burns but whenever we see more of infections then you we should go for this is what i feel raja um, my feeling is collagen can be used only when you do not want any anti bacterial effect and that means be that means now you can use it when a child comes with a burn immediately start you put it and forget it like that you should use but whereas when if you think that there is some amount of infection is there they cannot use collagen then you know you should go on to uh, acticot or i think you, yeah affordability yes, is also a factor <laughs> right ravi go ahead yeah we have a very clear cut protocol you know as far as uh, the use of collagen and the uh, acticot is concerned so if you have uh, uh, superficial second degree burns then you will uh, we use collagen you know and mostly these are scalds in children but if uh, the burns are deep second degree or the third degree then you have to do the acticot because in superficial second degree as raja said uh, the chances of infection are very less so acticot in fact uh, in superficial second degree burns is to be used only if there are extensive superficial second burns uh, uh, second degree burns where the chances of infection become little higher because of uh, the, uh, the uh, large areas so i don't think uh, in deep second degree burns and the third degree burns the collagen has any role so collagen's role is uh, primarily only in the superficial second degree burns also i think it would matter how soon the patient has come to you even if it's a superficial burn patient has come to you after 48 to 72 hours after colonization i would be hesitant to put collagen and then i think would go for one of these silver based dressings raji what do you say on this agree yeah i do agree with that sir Uh, as dr raja said that you know if it is a simple uncomplicated burn small child then they all can be managed by simple collagen dressings and they do heal very well but if there are deeper burns and signs of infection then we must go for acticot dressings right so and one question is has covid impacted cadaver graft harvesting uh, will we see a shortage of uh, skin allografts in the future Yes, we have recently had a meeting with the Noto, Soto, and Roto. That's National Organ and Tissue Transplantation Organization, and the state and the regional counterpart of this uh, organization. This was just last week, and uh, uh, we are coming out with a protocol for uh, skin harvesting even in post-COVID times because COVID is not going to go away. It's going to be there. We have to live with it for the next one and a half to two years, and uh, basically the protocol will uh, ensure that. the staff which goes to harvest is protected is safe 
to the relatives who are there and feel safe with the team going there. So the staff completely dons the protective equipment before entering the house, interacts with minimum number of people. Scrubbing of the body has to be done for a longer time with beta scrub and alcohol, uh, uh, chloric chlorhexidine and alcohol for at least 15 minutes. This, this ensures that the virus dies because this is a very fragile virus. It's an enveloped virus with a very thin uh, lipid membrane on top of a RNA segment out there. And the, uh, uh, to ensure the negativity of the donor, even if the history says negative, he may be in the incubation period, the PCR testing, a nasal, nasal swab, and an antibody testing from the cadaver would become mandatory. We will share the protocols with you once they are ready in about two to three weeks' time. Rajiv, anything else? Because we have finished most of our questions. Yeah, yeah. I think, sir, we should conclude the session uh, because we've taken a uh, lot of questions. And uh, now I would like to thank all the speakers, Dr. Rajasavapati, Dr. Ravi Majan, Dr. K. Swani, yourself, Dr. Sanjeev Uppal, who have taken out time, especially on a Sunday morning, to give such, such nice lectures. And I thank all the participants. We have had more than 200 participants in this session who have taken the time and listened to us. There were some questions, there were some issues regarding the recording. I'll check with that. I'll check, I'll take consent of the speakers. And if the speakers give consent, then we can share the recording of this presentation to the participants who request. So, um, so on this note, I'd like to conclude. I can't offer you coffee or anything, but maybe we can have it in the midterm meeting. Mm -hmm. Really, I thank everyone who have come today on the same platform on a Sunday morning to, to discuss about birds. Thank you so much.